Thanks. Uh, it's really great to be here. And, um, and so I'm going to, uh, it'll be interesting to see. Um, uh, last time I was here, I talked primarily about uh, computational stuff. Today it'll be mostly experimental, but it's all kind of towards the same goal. And uh, so what you're seeing here, this is the courtyard in the Clark Center at Stanford. And uh, our lab, just for a fun activity, uh, did a photo here. So this is supposed to look like the outline of a cell. Okay, and here we're all clasping arms uh, to be the nuclear membrane. Okay, and my son Peter is holding a green flashlight, and he's running in and out of the nucleus. Okay, and uh, my daughter Anya was supposed to do the same thing, but she is terrified <laughs> of the nucleus, so she's rebating in the nucleus. Okay, so uh, and then in the middle, my, one of my postdocs is actually writing writing ERC. And what I like about this photo is that it basically tells the story I'm going to tell you today about a new kind of sensor that we've made that can detect uh, activities of different uh, proteins, signaling proteins, and give us an output that we can read easily just by basically the fraction of uh, fluorescence that we see in the nucleus as opposed to the uh, cytoplasm. But I want to anchor that first of all in what uh, I propose to the Allen Foundation and what they've been uh, generous enough to, uh, to fund and really kind of taking a chance on, on a crazy idea. Um, as many of uh, you might know, so we spent some years, some years ago we uh, reported a construction of a, a whole cell model, okay, for the simplest bacterium. And what that means is we were trying to take into account all of the gene functions, all of the molecular functions that were known in this organism, Mycoplasma genitalium, and integrate them in some way that we could use that model to predict phenotypes. And uh, it's been really exciting working in that project. And uh, one thing, one big point I want to make is that um, the Allen Foundation, for me, uh, has been generous uh, with funding, but they've also provided something more, which is an impetus to reach further than we we're planning on reaching. So I still remember, and I've said this a few times, but I still remember when uh, Alan Jones came into my office and, and, uh, and I'd never met him before. I had no idea really why we were talking or anything, but, uh, but we were just shooting the breeze and, um, and he started really pushing me about, you know, don't you think it's time to start thinking about mammalian cells? Like, don't you think it's time to start thinking about a mammalian cell model? And, and I, I said, well, I don't, I don't, you know, I'm already feeling pretty good just that we have this tiny, <laughs> this minimal cell model and, and it seems like a really big jump. But um, when he left, I found that I just kept thinking about this. Like, wow, wouldn't it be, like, it makes sense to try to do something hard early because you'll probably fail, but at least you'll know why you failed. Okay, and then you'll know what the technologies are that need to be developed over the next year so that eventually you could have some kind of success. And so that led, um, that and some other experiences led us to write a paper that we called The Future of Whole Cell Modeling, where we tried to really go in and say, okay, these are the different things that really need to be developed, okay? And they're, importantly, they're not all modeling, okay? So definitely there's a whole thing about building new kinds of models, but there's very much uh, big holes that are needed to be filled in data curation, accelerated computation, visualization, validation, uh, facilitating communities and collaboration, okay, the big efforts required in all of these, in all of these things, and we've spent a lot of time now thinking about them and trying to think how can we contribute to each of these arms, right, not just to the model building. One of the biggest, of course, uh, is just trying to find what kind of experiments need to be generated. Um, and so that's what I'm going to talk about today. Our goal, uh, and a goal that we we uh, presented in our application to the Allen Foundation was um, we wanted to try and create data uh, that would make mammalian cells the best platform for generating the data that we needed for our whole cell models. Okay? And what that means, if you look here, we want to be making measurements in single cells okay, of heterogeneous but large scale data sets okay, and bringing them together in that same cell to have just truly integrated single cell personalizable um, modeling parameters. And I'll give you just quickly here, what you're looking at is a video 
of the kind of data that I love to generate in the lab, these are a bunch of cells and they're expressing a fluorescent protein that's bound to a transcription factor called NF-kappa B. We've labeled their nuclei, their nuclei in red here. What I just want you to see, NF-kappa B is a transcription factor. When it gets active, it goes into the nucleus, so it'll go into that red part. And when it's in there, it will initiate uh, transcription. So genes will start being expressed. So I can show you this here. Okay, so you can see them getting active. Okay, this has been brought up before, especially in the first session, which was uh, just a thrill to see all of, those, all of those different lines of thought coming together. But I want you to see also that these things are pretty different from one another. Let's see if I can rerun it. Maybe I'll have to go back. Okay. They're all very different from one another, and they can do crazy things. And just to give you an idea, I've been looking at this video for years, but I never saw, watch this cell, okay? I never saw this until just a couple months ago. Okay, it goes in. And it does a full 360. <laughs> Anyone wants to know more about that, I, I actually know more about it now. But it's just the point being, you never know what's in these data sets. How are you going to get that out of it? How are you going to get the rare events out of it? And how are you going to put all that together? So NF-kappa B, I'm just going to rifle through this because I want to show you the fun stuff, is part of the innate immune signaling network. Okay? You can see lots of different signals integrate and come through to NF-kappa B. It kind of goes very much with what Hanna was saying earlier. These things don't operate in parallel. They're all totally mixed up. Uh, but we've watched NF-kappa B because it is this kind of central protein factor family. And I'll just show you what we've done with that over the years. Uh, first of all, just to emphasize that looking at these movies takes an incredible amount of computation, right? As, uh, as many people in the audience will know. You have to come up with the experiments, but then there's a whole bunch of processing segmentation and tracking that has to happen to be able to get out the data that you want, which is basically to look at the activity of this protein over time. Um, and so once you do that, I showed you some oscillations here before, but what I want you to see is that uh, NF-kappa B, this is the, how much is in the nucleus over time. It goes in and out of the nucleus. We've never actually seen these cells stop. As long as we go, we continue to see them oscillating in and out of the nucleus. And I love this figure also because it gives you an idea of how important dynamics are, okay? So the typical person who studies NF-kappa B using, let's say, Western blot or something like that, usually they look at zero, at four hours, and at eight hours, okay? And the conclusion that they draw is that it gets active at eight hours, <laughs> okay? So just to give you an idea of how important the dynamics are and how important the cellular heterogeneity is. Now, if you've seen the movie Inception, imagine that I'm taking this, Inception style, psh, I'm going like this, so now you're looking down at the top of it, and that's what this next slide is going to be. So one row here, okay, would be like one cell. Okay, so now you're looking down, and the red means it's active. So here I'm just showing you a lot, a shorter time period, but I'm showing you that we can collect this information for lots of different cells, and we can look at the heterogeneity. We can get parameters and also distributions of parameters for each of these cells. And so that's all great. This has been around for a while. But the big question in the lab was, can we do this for other kinds of proteins? Okay. Or in particular, could we do this for kinases? Okay. Kinases are, um, as you know, a very exciting kind of protein. They're very often implicated in cancer. There's all kinds of uh, uses for them. There are many different kinds. And so we thought it might be fun to try and make reporters that could uh, report kinase activity in live single cells. Okay, so without going too, um, again, I apologize, I'll have to rifle through some of this stuff pretty fast, but we developed this technology that we call KTR, or Kinase Translocation Reporter Technology. It's a pretty simple concept. The idea is basically that you take the docking site, okay, this is now a, a DNA construct, okay, you take the docking site of a kinase target, okay, you fuse that to this little construct here. And this construct has a nuclear localization signal and a nuclear export signal. And so an active kinase will bind here. It will phosphorylate these two sites. And this site inhibits the import, the nuclear import. And this site, phosphorylation, enhances the export. 
okay? And the whole thing is connected to a fluorescent protein. So all of a sudden, we can convert these phosphorylation events to nuclear translocation events. And um, quickly here, this was originally found when we uh, developed this in what's called CJUN, which is a target of the junk uh, kinase. And basically, this was our first kind of indication that something like this was going to work. Here we have an active, uh, the inactive uh, kinase, okay, so it's in the nucleus, and when it gets activated, it leaves. So I'm going to show you a movie now that tells that story better. So here you have a bunch of cells. We're going to treat this with something to stimulate junk, okay, and then we're going to, then we're going to add in a junk-specific inhibitor. Okay, so you can see it's going to go out, whoops, out, boom, and then we add the inhibitor, and it all comes back. Okay, so very nice and sensitive. This is just to show you we did a bunch of validation. We looked at Western blots. We looked at immunofluorescence. Okay, we compared it to, to a FRET reporter that existed. And in every case, we found that we were able to recapitulate what was known. And in some cases, in particular with the FRET reporter, to outperform it because it's more sensitive to the off rate in these KTRs than, it is, than the FRET is. Uh, what I found exciting, going back to this whole cell modeling idea, right, is that we could also make a model, a small model in this case, uh, if you consider that the, the reporter can either be in or out of the nucleus, okay, in, out, and it can either be activated, like phosphorylated or not, you can make this very nice four-state model. You can make genetic constructs that, uh, that are act actually phosphomimetic, mimetic or non-phosphorylatable, and you can use this model then from your single cell reporter trajectories, you can back calculate active kinase concentrations, which has never been done before, never been uh, done before in a, in a live single cell. So here we have estimates of the active kinase concentration, okay, that we're now able to get from this reporter, thanks to uh, adding in a little bit of modeling and some uh, and some genetics. Okay. What's really nice is each of these reporters only requires one color. So it enables us to put a few reporters in the same cell, which is kind of nice. So we have made, just to give you an idea, it's very simple to make these. We've made these three as part of our first study. In the last year, I bet we've doubled or tripled the world's storehouse of, uh, of kinase reporters. Just we're making them all the time, um, and if people have a kinase that they're particularly interested in and they'd like to, we can either give them a fish or we can teach them to fish. I'm happy on any of those, so let me know if you're interested. Um, but we took these three because here's, again, the NF-kappa B. Here's these three kinases. So we've been kind of looking at different combinations of these, and I'll just show you one fun thing. This data is just to show you that each one of these is specific. So what you're seeing here is that if you take anisomycin, you'll activate this junk KTR, okay? It's not inhibited by any, any other inhibitor except for that specific junk inhibitor. You can say the same thing here for the P38. It's only inhibited by the P38 inhibitor. Say the same thing for ERK. It's only inhibited by the ERK inhibitor. And, uh, well, I could show you this, but let's just go through for the sake of time. This, uh, I'll show you the data that comes from this movie, but what you'll see here are kind of beautiful little flickering. Even in the unstimulated state, it has these interesting dynamics. Um, and you can put them all in the same cell, which is pretty amazing. So what I'm going to show you here, just in our limited time, is that now one of these rows is still just one single cell. Okay, it's one cell, but it's in three channels. You have the ERK channel, the P38 channel, and the junk channel. And what you can see is when you stimulate them, so here you see all this flickering I was talking about prior to stimulation. Here they get stimulated. This one has kind of a, long, a short activity and then is done, goes back to basal. This one has a longer activity usually, but again, you should see there's a nice distribution here. This one's kind of intermediate. Uh, but Here's the fun part. Okay, so now what we can do is treat these things with inhibitors. So first, we're taking these cells and we're going to treat them with a junk inhibitor. Okay, and it's a junk-specific inhibitor, remember. So here we're stimulating them. 
this gets stimulated. Then it goes down, um, and you can see that junk is cut off by this inhibitor, but these two aren't. You see that? They're kind of both just in their normal state. Okay, so that's what I want you to see. Down here, we have a P38 inhibitor, okay? And so here we go in, we knock out P38 with that inhibitor, but what I want you to see is that in both of these cell, both of these other channels, right away, you see activity, right? So what you know in a single experiment, thanks to the fact that you have these things all linked in the same individual cell, you can immediately deduce that this must somehow be a regulator, right, that's impacting the activity of these two. So my point being that we've talked about dynamics, we've talked about variability between cells and how important that is, but I also want to just emphasize as much as possible that the more of the same, the more data that you can get out of one cell, right, integrated together, the more powerful your measurements are going to be. And I think in particular when those, uh, when those data are heterogeneous. So I've told you already, we probably have 10 to 12 kinase reporters right now, CDKs and MPK and RSK. It's, uh, it's been very exciting to look at these different reporters. Um, and we've also, we've seen them work in, um, in other cells besides mammalian cells, certainly many cell types. We're very interested in trying to uh, exploit them in other contexts. And uh, there are, everything that we have that's published so far is available on AdGene, so feel free to contact me or go to AdGene directly. But I want to end with one last thing, because I talked about this new technology. It's great, because we get these dynamic uh, traces of activity, which is really exciting. But I really want to see as much as I can possibly see in one cell. And I want to see more data types than just uh, transcription factor or just kinases. In particular, I'd love to see gene expression. And so what we've done most recently, uh, we've been very, kind of even early days, it's been nice for us to have a lab next to Steve Quake because we've been involved with microfluidics, which has been great. And um, over the last year, year and a half maybe, we've been really excited uh, to uh, interact with Fluidime who, as you know, developed this C1 platform where they're able to do RNA-seq, like sequence all of the RNA in a single cell. They have a great machine. It's being used uh, regularly, but, uh, but the technology that we wanted to develop was to be able to actually use the same chip that goes into this RNA-seq plate or a platform, take that same chip, and then um, make it so that we could do our imaging on that chip. Okay, so what would happen in this case is that we could look at multiple kinases plus a transcription factor or more, look at them all for a day, and then go back and do the RNA-seq and actually get the full global transcriptome in that same individual cell. It was a real pain in the neck to do it because um, those cells, the way that the protocol has worked previously, they only live about an hour in there and they're extremely hard to see and they kind of ball up. But Kira, uh, my intrepid postdoc who you saw there, she was able to do a number of things to optimize the viability of those cells. And so here you can see a bunch of unstimulated cells originally. So they're not healthy and they're also just really balled up. Here now they're nice and spread out. We can image the nuclei so we can see them very readily. We can do our imaging there. And um, it's hard to see just here on this screen, but what I want you to see is that you can actually look, like in this case, you can see an oscillation. NF-kappa B is going into the nucleus. It's coming out. It's going back in. It's coming back out. But these different cells have different dynamics of NF-kappa B activation. And so uh, we've been able to go in and get, like for each, each plate, which gives us 96 individual cells, okay? We've done this now for several plates. And we've gone in and we've taken these dynamics and now uh, we've gone in and sequenced all of their RNA. And we're just starting to analyze this. This is now, uh, this, this is now current pretty much to the minute. <laughs> we're working on the analysis. But I want to give you this sense of where we're going, which is that you know, at some point in the near future, you know, we will have obtained data in multiple channels, right? Kinases, transcription factors, and the full, and that all in dynamic high time resolution. 
and then the full global transcriptome, okay, in the same cell, you know, for a variety of different cells. I'm on it. So, um, so that's what I, I wanted to leave you with. And I'm, I, again, I feel like that is getting us to this point, right? So this is something that we can't do in E. coli. Um, and so it's really exciting to me to see us uh, starting to make progress in this area. And again, I just want to thank um, the Allen uh, Foundation and also you know, all the different members for, for inspiring me and for helping me to, to kind of uh, move more in this direction. Okay, so with that, I'll also like to thank the lab, in particular, Sergi, who uh, really had the idea for the KTRs and was amazing in making it happen. Also, Stefan at Fluidime. Um, and finally, just, you know, again, for that funding and support. And uh, with that, I'll take any questions. Yeah, it's a great question. So this is a really nice system for something like that because we can just, you know, we just make a bunch of constructs, right, and do it. Yep, we are very interested in doing that. We haven't yet just because what we're mostly doing is making a bunch right now, <laughs> which, has been, which has been really enjoyable. But one thing that's interesting along those lines, uh, and I was just telling uh, Michael about this, is that the specificity becomes a really interesting question, right? So, for example, when we tried to make an AMPK um, reporter, we ended up making an RSK reporter, right? And, and we've also had other cases where we have reporters that respond to a few different kinases. So there's, again, using this kind of a, a mutant analysis or something, we'd really be able to say some very exciting things about specificity. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, you have a, a limitation on speed. That is, if the response that would, uh, is, it takes a second to mon be monitored with a f Fred reporter, but I would imagine is sort of lost uh, the, the yeah. fine details. So it's better for the slower kinases, et cetera, like NF kappa. Yeah, so there'd be some cases in which a fret definitely would be better. Like if it comes to the off rate, so what we see is the on rate, and again, we haven't looked at the fastest kinases, but I could imagine that you're right. Um, with the off rate, this one definitely, because once that fret pair kind of goes together, it takes a while for that to be, to come off. At least what we've, what we've measured and what we've seen published. You don't think so? So the data was up here for junk, but I'm happy to talk to you about it. And yeah. Also, you require a lot of cells which are flat and highly You have to be able to see the nucleus. Yeah, it's definitely true. So this is never going to abolish the need for a fret reporter. Yep. Oh, it's a beautiful system. Uh, Thanks. I'm just wondering if you see in uninhibited cells, if you see any dynamic correlations between the three channels when you do the three color experiment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so far it's interesting because, like, looking at that ERC, you know, you see all these kind of little, um, really just fluctuations. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason yet to how they're operating. You know, they don't seem to operate in sync. I'm sure things like that do exist. Um, we see a lot where we, where I deleted some slides where we show some things with NF kappa B in some of these kinases and you see some really cool correlations um, that you wouldn't have seen just in the one channel. I'm happy to talk to you more about them. Yeah, they're pretty cool. Yeah. I feel like I should be asking you the questions. Uh, we use a lot of kinase inhibitors in cancer, obviously. A lot mm -hmm. of them are related to activating mutations. But mm -hmm. in lymphoma, they're usually not. Uh, inhibitor of BTK, inhibitor of PI2K delta, yeah. inhibitors of nf kappa B. Mm -hmm. Could kinase uh, labeling like this uh, actually be used, you think, in some sense, to, to determine drug sensitivity? as a model for, for sensitivity within yeah. a patient's it's discrete a, tumor? It's a great idea, and actually I'd love to get more thoughts from you about it. So we were approached by some friends about doing this with the Gleevec resistance, which I'd really love to do, and we're just kind of starting to wrap our mind around what that would mean. And yeah, so it's, it's fascinating, and I'd love to do it.
and CLL cells would be a great model. They're circulating. We have emerging resistance to BT BTK inhibitors, yeah. so it would be a really exciting prospect. It's really early days, so we've tried a few things. Maybe the most beautiful data I've seen come from here. Um, I, I didn't show it because my, my postdoc's on the job market. I'm letting him show it. But if you, uh, he does this amazing thing where he's got everything expressing these, these three. Okay, he grows it up in a plate and then he scratches it and you see these beautiful, very different waves propagate from the origin of the, the scratch. And so you can see this incredible coordination. We've also seen somebody in a plant, they put them into a plant and you can see these beautiful rings form in the leaf before the stomata, the stomata form. So yeah, there's some amazing stuff that you could do with it, but one of my favorites would be to apply it to cancer, yeah. Great, thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.